blue chip stocks resume their record-setting ways today as the Dow Jones Industrial Average soared nearly 86 and one-half points to a new record-closing high. Good evening, I'm Paul Kangas in Miami. And I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. The stock market's rise was sparked by new reports of a slowing economy and by coordinated intervention by the Federal Reserve and other major central banks to boost the sagging dollar. Nightly Business Report is made possible by Digital. Doing whatever it takes to make information work for people and not the other way around. Franklin and Templeton Worldwide formed the more than $115 billion Franklin Templeton Group, a global alliance of mutual funds and investment products distributed by investment professionals. A.G. Edwards, going beyond stocks and bonds with our Ultra Asset account, offering investors comprehensive information and services to help them manage their portfolio. And is produced in association with Reuters, which provides instant access to the world's financial markets. Buyers stormed onto Wall Street today as the Dow posted its biggest point daily gain in three and a half years. The market's rise came after the government said the economy grew at a slower pace in the first quarter than previously expected. Scott Gervey reports. The Federal Reserve's seven interest rate hikes continue to drag on the rate of economic growth. This first revision to the first quarter growth rate took it to 2.7 percent. The news was a big surprise on Wall Street, where most economists had predicted an upward revision. But they say it is no cause for alarm. I think this is a slowdown in the economy, not a stop. The decline in housing and in autos, two of the most cyclically sensitive sectors, I think is pretty much already finished. There were signs in the reports of a continued inventory correction and some signals of inflationary price increases. But while street estimates put second quarter growth in the neighborhood of 2%, most analysts see a pickup in economic activity in the second half. For example, the effects of higher interest rates can be clearly seen in the sales of new homes. They fell 2.7% in April, but revisions raised figures for the preceding two months. And these figures do not reflect the effect of the sharp decline in interest rates posted in just the last month. There is some speculation the Federal Reserve will lower its official rates to catch up with the markets. I think if the Fed were to see uh, further declines in some of the coincident indicators, like this Friday's non-farm payrolls, uh, they would probably be more inclined to ease rates a notch lower either at the July 5th or the August 22nd meetings. The employment report is the most carefully watched and politically significant piece of the economic puzzle. The report for May is due out on Friday and is expected to show the creation of 180,000 new jobs. Scott Gervey, Nightly Business Report, New York. Wall Street's bulls also reacted positively today to a surprise intervention in the currency markets by the Federal Reserve and other central banks. The move boosted the dollar and raised hopes that the greenback has found a bottom. The dollar jumped more than two and three-quarter fennigs against the mark, rose nearly two yen, and also closed higher against the British pound. Darren Gersh has more from Washington. The Federal Reserve and central banks around the world surprised traders with the aggressive move into the currency markets. Analysts say the Fed acted in part to keep the U.S. economy's soft landing from turning into a hard landing for the dollar and the global economy. And I think the central banks are trying to make a sustained effort here, surprise the market perhaps by supporting the dollar. They believe that a strong yen and a strong Deutschmark is starting to hinder world economic recovery. The dollar has been driven down in part over concerns a weakening U.S. economy may lead to lower U.S. interest rates. Since December, the U.S. one-year deposit rate has plunged from 7.5% to below 6% dropping much more sharply than returns for investments in other countries. The U.S. inflation outlook is also much worse than in Germany and Japan, making an investment in the U.S. even less attractive. I think if the dollar continues to fall like this, many international investors may question whether they really want to be holding U.S. assets. If they scale back, that's going to mean a rise in our interest rates. Traders are now left wondering how serious the G7 nations are about propping up the dollar and whether more actions are on the way, perhaps a coordinated round of interest rate cuts beginning when the German Central Bank meets tomorrow. Currency traders are likely to test the resolve of the G7 to defend the dollar, 
especially since many already believe the intervention was a political move by the U.S. to blunt criticism of its hands-off dollar policy. I think the intervention today was politically inspired ahead of the G7 meeting. I think it's given a short-lived boost to the dollar, but I think the dollar will continue to slide as U.S. growth signs slow and market interest rates continue to fall, making our assets very unattractive to foreigners. Analysts say the G7 nations got a big bang today for the $2 billion they are estimated to have poured into the currency markets, but many are betting the dollar will drop again without changes in German, Japanese, or U.S. interest rates. Darren Gersh, Nightly Business Report, Washington. Yesterday's sharp sell-off in Wall Street's high technology stocks extended into early trading today and helped to drag the Dow Industrial Average down 10 points by 10 a.m. with market breadth 4 to 3 negative. Today's report showing weakness in uh, gross domestic product and new home sales were gradually overshadowed by that strong comeback in the dollar after the Federal Reserve and other central banks moved to support it. And by noon, the industrial average bounced back to post an 18-point gain. The rapid recovery triggered frantic short covering purchases by scared bears caught in what we call a short squeeze. And with the added help of recovering bond prices, the Dow Jones Industrial Average vaulted to a closing gain of 86.46 points, or 1.9%, to a new record closing high at 4465.14. So the Dow closed right at its best level of the session. That was up 97.5 points uh, from its low. So what a tremendous range today. Volume picked up significantly, 359.6 million shares, and uh, up volume just absolutely swamped down volume by about six times. The transport's up 35.40 points, or 2.18 percent. Utilities had a great day, up 2.77. The closing tick still very bullish at plus 658. A new high in the Standard & Poor's 500 with that gain of nearly 10 points. The 100 at a new high with a 10 and a half point gain. Mid cap 400 up a little over a point and a half near a record high. The Commodity Research Bureau spot index edged up two thirds of a point. The New York Stock Exchange Composite at a record with that gain of 4.57. Value line up 2.39, not a record. But the Wilshire 5000 set a record with that gain of nearly 73 points. Despite today's reports of weakness in new home sales and the downward revision in first quarter GDP growth, bonds opened lower, partly because their recent gains already had discounted these latest signs of weakness. Some traders were also concerned that a decline in business inventories could soon lead to a buildup which would revitalize the economy. This worry, however, was wiped away today by the dollar's impressive strength. As a result, tax-free and corporate issues wiped out early losses to close up an eighth of a point on average, and the long-term government market ended up five thirty seconds of a point, bringing that yield down to 6.65%, the lowest in about a year and a half. The Lehman Brothers Long Bond Index gained at 0.76, and Fed funds edged up a bit from yesterday to close at 6 and 3 sixteenths percent. Later, I'll show you where the action was on Wall Street today. Kathy? Billionaire Kurt Kerkorian and his Tracinda company today withdrew their spurned takeover bid for Chrysler, but Kerkorian says he will not sell his 36 million shares in the company. Last month, Kerkorian, who is Chrysler's largest shareholder, offered to pay almost $23 billion for the company. But when Chrysler rejected the offer, Kerkorian couldn't find an investment bank to assist him. But he's found one now, Walserstein Perella and Company, a firm known for taking risks. With me now is auto analyst David Garrity of Smith Barney. David, do you think that Walserstein Perella will try to formulate a new strategy for taking over Chrysler? I think that there are a few things that Wasserstein could pursue, namely one, further relaxing the poison pill provision at Chrysler in the hope of maybe making the company a little more attractive for another strategic buyer to come in. Uh, Wasserstein might also try to work with advising Kerkorian uh, as to what other financing sources might be available, uh, but certainly I think it is an issue right now that there are very few options that Wasserstein can pursue beyond what we just mentioned. Do you think that they'll be able to somehow pressure Chrysler to take further further steps to enhance shareholder value? I think Chrysler's been under a fair amount of pressure so far. They can keep uh, the drumbeat going, if you will. Uh, so certainly management can't expect anything of a break necessarily. Uh, but I don't know what real other measures they might be able to take to intensify the pressure on the company. Well, they've got all that cash. Well, that's the interesting point, is that if you look at the sort of weakness that we've seen in auto sales, Chrysler has been looking at some defenses that they've needed to take in protecting their market share. Mm -hmm. So the company has been very aggressive in raising incentives. With all that cash, they can be very aggressive in the marketplace, and if they have to choose between either paying that back out to shareholders, such as Gregorian, or using it to defend their market share, more than likely they'll raise incentives and defend market share. 
That Chrysler stock was up a point today. Do you think it was because of this news or because the market was generally so strong? Overall, the Dow was up very strongly. Uh, some very favorable comments being made with respect to the economic outlook. All the auto stocks rallied. And GM was up one and three eighths. Chrysler up a point. So I don't think there was anything particular coming from this uh, announcement by Jacinda that they're retaining Wasserstein Perella. We just have a couple of seconds left. What are your recommendations on the big three automakers? Overall, we've been neutral on the big three. Uh, the large cap companies we like in the automotive area, Goodyear Tire been our top pick. So you'd buy Goodyear, but you wouldn't buy GM, Ford, or Chrysler? Well, we would hold GM, Ford, and Chrysler at current levels, but we really would pursue, continue pursuing Goodyear. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our guest, David Garrity of Smith Barney. According to the U.S. Treasury Secretary, Mexico's economy is getting stronger every day with the help of U.S. dollars. During his first monthly report to Congress on the issue, Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin said Mexico is making great strides towards stabilization. But Rubin says it will take time, and much attention has to be paid to the control of inflation and potential problems in the Mexican banking industry. The administration appears to be easing its stance against Japan in the trade dispute over car imports. An official said today that the U.S. has agreed to Japan's request to discuss the dispute in Geneva by mid-June. If the talks do begin then, they could coincide with the economic summit in Halifax. Punitive tariffs on Japanese luxury cars are scheduled to take effect later in June. Meanwhile, the European Union today formally asked Washington to allow it to take part in the U.S.-Japan auto trade talks. The move reflects Europe's growing anxiety that it could be left out of any deals Washington and Tokyo may strike. Right correspondent Steen Stovall has more. Mickey Cantor says he has right on his side, but most world politicians say his unilateral actions in the car dispute with Japan are wrong. That includes Margaret Thatcher. She was a staunch U.S. ally when she ran Britain in the 1980s. Now she says Washington should not be threatening to slap 100% tariffs on luxury Japanese car imports by the end of next month if it doesn't get its way. Thatcher's so, former economic advisor uh, agrees with her. I mean, it's a sort of bad policy that they've identified and condemned in other countries, yet they're trying to do it here. The European Union, comprising 15 countries, has stepped firmly into this trade squabble. It says it will challenge any deals that the Americans and Japanese agree on if they go against the economic interests of Europe. The Europeans certainly do not want to see these uh, luxury Japanese cars diverted dramatically into the European market. This would be a, a big problem for the European luxury car producers, and it's a very real possibility. But trade lawyers say Europe has its own way of dealing with the, the issue of Japanese like cars. Canada. The truth be known, they have their own sweetheart deals. For example, there are some countries that import only as, as much as 5% of their total automobile uh, for, uh, importations or the market through the Japanese. The United States already has 20, 25%. So the, the Europeans are not as lily white as they'd like to, to, uh, to, to maintain. Realistically, the Americans and the Europeans have a different way of dealing with the issue of car imports from Japan. The Americans, on the one hand, want to go to a very results-oriented um, uh, outcome, whereas the European Union wants to set um, very strict quota rules and deal within that. The European Union wants Japan's markets opened up. To that extent, Europeans support the aggressive stance being taken by the U.S., but they don't want to be disadvantaged by any car deal that's eventually struck. So Europeans will be watching this poker game between Washington and Tokyo very closely. Steen Stovall of Reuters for Nightly Business Report, London. Still ahead on Nightly Business Report, many Americans are choosing to do their banking by phone, computer, or ATM. One Chicago bank is taking an aggressive step to encourage that type of business by charging customers a fee to use a teller. Chief Executive Edgar Bronfman Jr. said today he hopes the company's purchase of the film studio MCA will be completed next week. Bronfman also said, contrary to speculation, Seagram has no plans to sell its 15% stake in Time Warner. His comments came at a news conference in Montreal after the company's annual meeting. Bronfman refused to say how the MCA purchase will affect Seagram's earnings, but Paul, the company hopes to have a firm projection within two months. Seagram's stock today edged up an eighth to close at 30. 
Dow Jones Industrial Average did considerably better than that. The best one-day gain in three and a half years of nearly 86 and a half points at a record high. Broader market participated better than two to one on the advance over to the decline uh, ratio. 156 new highs for the year versus only 13 new lows. Topping the active list, Micron Technology on five and three quarter million shares, almost recouping yesterday's, yesterday's four-point gain with a three-point or a loss with a three-point gain. Merck up one and three quarters. That's a Dow stock. Certainly helped the uh, the uh, industrial average. Uh, PepsiCo moved up one and a half. Some good strength here in growth issues. Chrysler gained a point as you heard. Ford Motor up three quarters of a point. Stone Container a one point advance as was the case with Walmart. Compact Computer up one and an eighth. Telmex uh, up three sixteenths. Not much movement in the Mexican market today. The Bolsa Index up only six and a half points. Motorola recouping some recent lost ground with a one and an eighth point gain. AMR parent of American Airlines up two full points helping that Dow Transport Index gain nearly thirty five and a half points. And all the rest of the stocks on the board are Dow stocks. DuPont up two. Kodak gaining one and three eighths. General Motors did well up one and three quarters. A Moody's Investor Service increased uh, GM's senior debt rating and also gave its commercial paper its highest rating. That'll cut borrowing costs for General Motors. Minnesota Mining doing well up two points and Procter & Gamble up two and three eighths. High Shear Industries up one and an eighth. Uh, the story here, the company received a favorable court ruling on appeal absolving the firm of some $11 million in liabilities uh, from certain government contracts. Tally Industries up one and a quarter. The company had no news, uh, but uh, it's also in the aerospace product and services business, just like high share industries, could be sympathetic reaction. Dollar General, the dip, deep discount store chain, up two and a quarter points. Company had no news to account for that strength. Wallace Computer, which makes a lot of business forms, up one and five eighths. Third quarter earnings nicely higher, 64 cents up from 52 cents. Sales up 27 percent. Raytech, the biggest percentage loser of the day, down 28.6 percent. And the company said its policy is not to comment. Despite that huge loss, that's its policy. It makes customs en engineered materials. Royal Caribbean, the big cruise line, down one and three eighths. Merrill Lynch today downgraded the stock from above average to near term neutral. NASDAQ trading, a gain of 5.88 in the index, but not a new high. Of course, you'll call yesterday a drop 13 points. Volume heavy, 376.1 million shares, well up from yesterday. About 18 stocks higher for every 15 lower. Intel topped the active list, uh, making a little comeback, up one and three quarters. Microsoft also up one and a fraction. Cisco system showed no change. Applied Materials up one and three eighths, and Altera, which tumbled six points yesterday after being sued for patent infringement by Xilex, rebounding three and a half. Oracle Systems gained a half. Novell, a similar gain. Amgen gained two and three eighths. Sun Microsystems up seven eighths of a point. And DSC Communications, no change. The only one that didn't show a gain in the ten most active Nasdaqs. Electric Fuel Corporation up two and a half points. Nice gain on news that Sweden's Postal Service has signed a pact to use the company's zinc air battery system to power its electric vehicles. BioChris Pharmaceutical a two-point gainer. The company says it's phase one trials uh, for its BCX34 drug for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma went quite well, quite promising. And Roberts Pharmaceutical tumbling four and an eighth after the company said it sees second quarter results falling well below, below Wall Street expectations. And the American Exchange Index up 0.77 at a record high, volume up uh, nicely from yesterday's pace to 20.9 million shares, about three stocks up for every two down. Viacom B atop the active list on one and a half million shares down three quarters. PLC Systems, the big gainer of the day, up two and three eighths points. The company says the FDA will expedite its application uh, for the marketing of its uh, heart laser for transmyocardial revascularization. And Gaylord Container moved up one and a quarter. This is another company which told us its policy is not to comment on the movement in its stock. And there was no news on the wires. That's our Wall Street wrap-up. Cassie? Services that some banks have traditionally offered for free are now carrying a price. Chicago's First National Bank is now charging for some teller services, and Nations Bank is charging a fee for debit cards and other customer services. As Diane Esterbrook reports, the trend is part of the changing landscape of banking. Getting cash this way costs the average bank less than 30 cents, but getting cash this way costs more than a dollar. The expense of teller services is why the First National Bank of Chicago made the controversial decision to charge customers with its most basic checking account $3 when they use a teller to make a deposit or a withdrawal. What I'm trying to do is have more time to sell and serve. And I do that by redirecting routine transactions to devices which are eminently better at doing those transactions today than the traditional one of a, of a live teller. But First Chicago's actions touched off a promotional blitzkrieg by competitors. It's a great opportunity for us and all of their other competitors to say, we've managed to keep costs down. We think that uh, 
we think that we can do a better job for the consumer. Banking today is becoming an increasingly competitive business. The stock and bond markets are vying for a larger share of investor dollars, and loan growth is slowing. To remain competitive, many banks are either cutting services or charging extra for them. A recent survey by Anderson Consulting found value or price ranks higher among consumers than service. There is a need to differentiate between the level of service and the quality of service. And what we're saying is one should not provide a level of service any greater than what is valued by the consumer. Because of the growing competition for investor dollars, banks will continue to look at what services they can afford to offer their customers. And many analysts predict those banks that currently aren't charging service fees may be forced to do so in the future. Diane Esterbrook, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Coming up in tonight's Money File, author Terry Savage has a word or two about pension funds. Good evening. The U.S. is the world stock market story today. Overall, news on local stocks remains somewhat quiet. Let's start with a look at the non-U.S. Currency again, an end-of-the-month sell program sent Japan tumbling. Selective Asian markets continue to be hot, in particular, foreign buying juiced Hong Kong last night. Germany, however, was a non-event. A better dollar helped France. Monday was a holiday in both the U.S. and U.K. London's thin trading volumes reflect that. And Mexico's president unveils his five-year national development plan. Turning quickly to local issues, Bell Atlantic enjoys another good day. Charter power was flat. Delmarva Power asked the Public Service Commission to okay a $7.3 million refund to customers. Dymark, which in the past has been a mover and a shaker, seems stalled. DuPont and the Dow Jones average had a nice day. Those lower U.S. interest rates continue to help the utility sector. Philly Elect and Public Service inch up again, and Zeneca continues to trade around its high. In other Delaware Valley business news, Scoreboard said it will feature Major League Baseball players in logos and uniforms on phone cards, and today's local new high list includes Penn Engineering and Manufacturing, Marsham Pharmaceuticals, and Merck. From Wilmington, I am Dace Blaskovitz. Funding provided in part by Marvin and Palmer Associates, Global Equity Managers. In our money file tonight, Terry Savage, author of New Money Strategies for the 90s and Beyond, talks about why everyone should keep an eye on their pension fund. If you were a politician who suddenly spied a three and one half trillion dollar golden egg nearby, would you be tempted to kill the goose? You bet. And in this case, it's working Americans who are the goose. The three and a half trillion is the golden pension nest egg of today's workers. How are those pension funds invested? Very carefully and under the rules of ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Now that law doesn't specify how pension fund assets are to be invested, but ERISA does require pension fund managers to act, and I quote, solely in the interest of the participants and beneficiaries. That's why so many pension plan managers were shocked when Washington started promoting something called ETIs, Economically Targeted Investments for Pension Funds. Now, these types of social projects ranging from low-cost housing to infrastructure might not give attractive returns to the pension funds, but they sure would provide a flow of capital for the so-called good works deemed necessary by the politicians. Legality? A recent ruling by Labor Secretary Robert Reich authorized these ETIs for pension plans. Now, the entire concept strikes many as a form of taxation without representation. Your retirement fund investments being compromised, taxed, if you will, to provide cash for the public good instead of the best investment returns. Those who oppose the pension grab have introduced a bill in Congress, the Pension Protection Act of 1995. They're trying to keep your goose from getting cooked. I'm Terry Savage. Tomorrow on Nightly Business Report, just what will CBS do now that it's lost Connie Chung and canceled half of its nightly lineup? We'll report on the annual meeting of CBS affiliates in Los Angeles. And finally tonight, don't squeeze the Charmin. It may have been a tax form in a previous life. The IRS Center in Northern Kentucky is selling used income tax forms and other waste paper to be recycled into toilet tissue. The center has made more than $55,000 from the 2 million pounds of waste paper it sold in the last year and a half. 
The money saved helps offset tuition for low-income children who attend the IRS Center's daycare program. Now, who says tax collectors have no heart? Although I hear rumors that poor Mr. Whipple is being audited. Oh, that's Nightly Business Report for Wednesday, May 31st. I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. Good night, Paul. Good night, Cassie. I'm Paul Kangas in Miami wishing all of you the best of goodbyes. Nightly Business Report is produced in association with Reuters, which provides instant access to the world's financial markets. And is made possible by A.G. Edwards, going beyond stocks and bonds with our Ultra Asset account, offering investors comprehensive information and services to help them manage their portfolios. Franklin and Templeton Worldwide, formed the more than $115 billion Franklin Templeton Group, a global alliance of over 110 mutual funds and investment products, including U.S. government securities funds. Digital, doing whatever it takes to make information work for people and not the other way around. And by the financial support of viewers like you. NBR has a videotape for anyone who's thinking about investing in stocks. It's How Wall Street Works, winner of the American Film and Video Festival's Blue Ribbon Award. To order by credit card, call 1-800-535-5864.